Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participant lines are in a listen-only mode. During the Q&A session, if you would like to ask a question, you may do so over the phone by pressing star 1. Today's call is being recorded. If you object, you may disconnect. It is my pleasure to turn the call over to your host for today, Ms. Carly Falm. Thank you, ma'am. You may begin. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the journalists on the call. I'm Carly Flaum with the FDA's Office of Media Affairs. Thank you for joining today's media call to discuss the FDA's recent approval of two treatments, Castjevy and Lisgenia. These therapies represent the first cell-based gene therapies for the treatment of sickle cell disease in patients 12 years and older. The FDA's press release on today's actions has been posted to our website. In a moment, Dr. Peter Marks, director of the FDA's Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, or CBER, and Dr. Nicole Verdun, director of CBER's Office of Therapeutic Products, will give their opening remarks. After the remarks, we'll move to the question and answer portion of the call. Reporters on the phone will be in a listen-only mode until we open the call for questions. As a reminder, this audio call is being recorded and a recording will be available on the FDA's YouTube page about an hour after the call concludes. When asking a question, please state your name and affiliation. Also, please ensure questions pertain to today's announcement and limit yourself to one question and one follow-up so that we can get to as many questions as possible. With that, I will now turn the call over to Dr. Marks, Director of the FDA's Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of the uh, entire agency, Dr. Verdun and I would like to thank you for joining us today uh, and for your continued dedication to supporting the interests and needs of uh, in individuals uh, living with sickle cell disease, um, which uh, is, as you know, uh, a serious and debilitating condition uh, with limited treatment options. Um, hang on for just one second, please. So oh, sorry about that. Um, sorry, we're back with you here now. Um, so uh, thank, thanks again uh, for, for joining this afternoon. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today about FDA's approval um, of uh, two milestone treatments for individuals affected by sickle cell disease, um, uh, Kisjevi uh, and Lifgenia. Um, these treatments represent a major advancement in the field of gene therapy for patients with sickle cell disease a rare and debilitating blood disorder affecting you know, approximately 100,000 people in the United States. Kashevi and Lefgeny are the first FDA-approved cell-based gene therapies to treat sickle cell disease in patients 12 years and older, and Kashevi is also the first FDA-approved treatment to utilize a novel genome editing technology called CRISPR-Cas9. The use of that technology is particularly exciting as it more broadly signifies an innovative advancement in the field of gene therapy and in fact, CRISPR-Cas9 was the subject for which the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded. With the approvals of Castrevi and Lifgenia, we now have two safe and effective treatments for sickle cell disease that have been thoroughly evaluated by FDA. And today's approvals demonstrate the continued momentum of this promising new area of medicine. The potential of these products ha have to transform the lives of patients living with sickle cell disease is enormous. So thank you, and I'll now turn it over to Dr. Verdun. Thank you, Dr. Marks. The FDA's approval of Kashjivi and Lifgenia represent an important advancement in our efforts to help ensure that people impacted by rare diseases, including sickle cell disease, have access to innovative, safe, and effective treatment options. I share Dr. Marks' excitement about today's approval, which represent continued scientific advancements and technological innovation in medical product development. Gene therapy holds the promise of delivering more targeted and potentially life-saving treatments, which is particularly important for patients with rare diseases, such as sickle cell disease, where there are limited treatment options available. As reflected in today's approvals, our team is committed to facilitating the development of safe and effective treatments for patients with unmet medical needs. 
These treatments signify an important medical advancement for patients with sickle cell disease and have potentially transformative implications for the future of gene therapy. Thank you. And now I will turn it back over to our moderator. Thank you, Dr. Verdun. At this time, we will begin the question and answer portion of the briefing. As a reminder, this call is being recorded. When asking a question, please state your name and affiliation. And again, please ensure that the questions pertain to today's announcement and limit yourself to one question and one follow-up so that we can get to as many questions as possible. Operator, we'll take the first question. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please unmute your phone, press star one, and record your first and last name slowly and clearly when prompted. Our first caller is Berkeley Loveless with NBC News. You may go ahead. Hi, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, thanks. Thank you. Okay, thanks for taking my question. Um, I had a question in regards to the black box warning on Bluebird Biotherapy. Um, what data did FDA look at to support that box warning? And also why didn't uh, Vertexas Therapy get that same warning as well? Um, and I guess the follow-up question, um, I guess, could could Vertex's uh, therapy eventually get that same warning? Thank you for your question. So the, the black box warning in the, the Bluebird label um, specifically was for um, myeloid malignancies or uh, two cases in particular of AML um, that happened during the, the clinical trial uh, for, the, for sickle cell disease. And um, those two patients actually uh, ended up um, having uh, death as, as, a, as a result of their malignancies. And so we thought that that rose to the level of a black box warning. Um, Vertex at this time um, has not had uh, malignancies that have occurred. And so for that reason, um, we did not think that um, it warranted a black box warning at this time. The, the bottom line, this is Peter, just to finish up adding to that is that Obviously, um, as we, we have follow-up time that, that elapses, it, we'll just have to see what comes up um, with these therapies. They, are, they, are, they do have different mechanisms of action, so we'll just have to see um, uh, what comes up with time. Thank you both. Operator, we'll take the next question, please. Our next caller is Sue Sutter with the pink sheet. You may go ahead. Hi, so at the advisory committee meeting on the Vertex product, that was really focused on um, the company's analysis of the potential for off-target effects and theoretical risks related to those off-target effects. And I'm just wondering how, if at all, did you deal with that in the labeling and the patient information? Thanks for your question. Um, the, yes, the advisory committee meeting was to look at the potential for these off-target effects, although, um, as we noted, we have not seen them uh, to date, and sort of just what the best way to study those are moving forward. The way we handled it in the, the label and the prescribing information is to put in that potential risk um, in, into that label so that patients are informed. Um, and, you know, we will, as Dr. Mark said, make adjustments as needed. Um, in the future, but it is listed as a potential risk. Thank you. Operator, we'll take the next question. All right, and our next caller is Lauren Gardner with Politico. You may go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, can you tell us more about the long-term follow-up that the companies are going to have to conduct for these products? Uh, what specifically are you asking them to collect data on? Um, and as a follow-up to that, do you have any guidance on when and how FDA would consider either or both of these therapies as actual cures for sickle cell? So um, in terms of the follow-up, we have um, reached an agreement with both sponsors to conduct long-term follow-up studies for um, 15 years, but in addition have encouraged um, with the, the label to continue to monitor uh, for malignancies lifetime for, uh, for, uh, for the rest of, of a patient's life after they receive these, uh, these therapies. And so um, specifically that involves uh, getting blood counts and also monitoring of the bone marrow. And, um, and we have, some, have had significant conversations with the sponsors who have both agreed to that, um, that follow-up. Thanks. 
Thank you. Operator, we'll take the next question. Our next caller is Adam Fierstein with STAT. You may go ahead. Uh, Ask and answered. Thanks a lot. And our next caller is Meg Terrell with CNN. You may go ahead. Well, thank you so much. Um, I do have my own question, but I loved that question about when the FDA would consider this a cure. So if you could try to answer that, that would be amazing. But my question is actually a follow-up to Berkeley's question um, about the the black box warning. Um, just because having conversations with doctors who treat sickle cell and also a bluebird bio itself, they um, say that the deaths, at least in their own work, um, they think we're more related to the chemotherapy conditioning regimen than the gene therapy itself. And since both treatments require that conditioning regimen, I just wonder if you could walk us through how you thought about whether Castevi patients should be monitored life, you know, for a lifetime risk of cancer. Thanks. So thanks for your questions. So um, in terms of the, the malignancy risk, in addition to the two AML cases, there was also a case of MDS. Um, and so, to your point, you know, the, the it's it's in, in terms of of causative, we have to inform the public. We're you know we're about transparency and informing the public of the risk. And if that there's there's not at this point definitive evidence to say specifically um, sort of what you were were asking about that it is just to the condition due to the conditioning um, regimen and that there is risk whenever you're editing um, genomes that is a known risk. And so uh, I think that, again, um, the, the, the point of the black box warning is really to inform the public of this risk, and, um, and, and that is in the setting of the entire yeah. Redmond, sorry, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, no, so, so, so I, I think what, what I think you're getting at here is we will continue to look at both of these, and I think you could argue that this is from the fact that the, the way these therapies work is this is like giving someone a stem cell transplant, and so they get busulfan, which is a chemotherapy agent up front, and then they get the modified, uh, the modified stem cells that have been generated by one of two means. Uh, for one of the products, it's using the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, that is uh, put into the cells using a non-viral means. And then by the other, uh, it's uh, having the, uh, the, uh, the corrective uh, gene therapy construct that's put into the cells using uh, a lentiviral vector, in other words, a viral vector. And so there, it's plausible, it, it, it's plausible there could be, they could have the same set of side effects due to the busulfan, or it's plausible that there could be interactions between uh, the busulfan and the, uh, each of the different uh, uh, products themselves so that they might have different overall safety profiles. And what we can only do at this point is put on the label what we've seen. Uh, uh, and I, I don't think uh, that it would be fair to dismiss um, at something to the conditioning regimen, because ultimately, I think we have to step back. These, and, and just let's think in a larger uh, uh, standpoint about what these therapies are. They really are potentially transformative, but it's not just about uh, the uh, conditioning regimen. It's about the totality of the therapy that's given, and not even just the totality of the uh, cell therapy with chemotherapy that's given, uh, to get the cells engrafted. It's also about the total care of the patient uh, that will need to happen because there will be additional uh, uh, care that will be needed to actually transition people. Some people, once they actually um, have received these therapies, will need additional care to come off of opioids and other medications that they may have been on previously. So this is really a total package. And so we'd like patients to be aware um, of all of the potential side effects that they might uh, 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 encounter that we're currently aware of. And in terms of, cur in terms of curative in intent, with the long-term follow-up studies um, that we have, have discussed with the sponsor that are 15 years, in addition, we will be looking at efficacy over time, and um, I think that that will be quite informative. Both therapies that were approved today through, through slightly different um, different mechanisms do decrease the number of vaso-occlusive events um, and uh, have the potential to, um, to take a, a sickle cell patient who has had 
several of these events um, to to have not have any of these events. And so I think over time, in terms of getting to that place where where we're saying what what at what point are we curative, we have to just sort of follow over time. But they're they're quite encouraging, and the results of both trials were were quite encouraging as well. And before we go to the next caller, if you would like to ask a question, please unmute your phone, press star one, and record your first and last name fully and clearly when prompted. Our next caller is Carolyn Johnson with the Washington Post. You may go ahead. Thanks. Um, my question was basically answered, but can they just clarify that um, is the only eligibility criteria that there are 12 with recurrent basal occlusive crisis, or is there any other upper age restriction or anything else? There's no upper age restriction. Yes, that's correct. 12 and older. And is recurrent vasoclusive crisis, is there a criteria, like number per year or something like that? No, not. And the indication is not written that way um, in terms of number per year. Okay, thanks. Yeah, let me just, just clarify that probably uh, my, my suspicion is that most providers will be thinking of this for um, uh, for patients who are in the hospital at least several times a year, uh, and not just somebody who has had a painful crisis and been managed as an outpatient. Um, although it's not labeled exactly that way, um, uh, I, I think in, in terms of a benefit risk uh, calculation, um, that's how it will be um, uh, put forward. And I think just to inform you, right, although the population is 100,000 people with uh, sickle cell disease uh, in the country, probably the, the, the population that really fits this is probably 20% um, of that um, uh, in terms of people who have more frequent crises um, uh, and uh, who end up in the hospital more frequently, um, uh, whereas many sickle cell patients, patients with sickle cell, living with sickle cell disease do so um, with only occasional crises. So this is really for those whose lives have been significantly impacted um, who sometimes uh, potentially look like they're going to suffer end organ damage um, from their sickle cell disease. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Marks and uh, Dr. Verdun. Um, that was our last question. This concludes today's media briefing. A recording of today's call will be made available on the FDA's YouTube page. Thank you all for joining. And this concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may disconnect at this time and have a great rest of your day.